Hello, my name is Mike Huner, and I'm going to be working with you guys today and teaching and talking through uh, testing of asphalt mixes, compacting specimens specifically. Uh, we're also going to be looking at uh, a couple of other tests as well that go along with that. So compacting specimens as well as performing uh, the bulk specific gravity test on those compacted specimens as well as the maximum specific gravity test uh, of our mixture. So before we get started, let's talk a little bit about those two terms a little more specifically and give you a little bit of a definition to help you understand what it is that we're doing and why. So first of all, the maximum specific gravity, and, and let me point out some nomenclature here in, uh, in case you're new to it. Uh, the GMM that you see there for max specific gravity, it stands for gravity mix maximum. Uh, we'll also talk about the bulk specific gravity. You notice that uses GMB for gravity mix bulk. But let's look at those definitions. So first of all, the maximum specific gravity of the mix, that refers to the relative specific gravity of an asphalt mixture at a theoretical maximum. So sometimes you'll hear people say theoretical max or TMD. There's some other names that we use for it, but it's the theoretical maximum or zero air void state as compared to water. And we're going to be using water in both of these tests to, to measure those mixtures, both in the compacted state or in the loose state. Um, and so it's a relative, it's, it's how it relates to the specific gravity of water. Okay. So maximum specific gravity represents a zero air void state. So if we can compact that mix so tight that there are no air voids in it, theoretically, this would be the specific gravity. The other term, bulk specific gravity, that we're going to be interested in, uh, the GMB, that refers to the relative specific gravity of the mixture in a compacted state. So we've taken that mix, we've compacted it uh, in the old days with the Marshall hammer, today with the super paved gyratory. So it's in a compacted state, and we're going to determine its specific gravity as compared to water. Okay, so both of these tests are going to use water. Now there's an important part of, of the water that we use. We want to make sure that that water has a certain specific gravity, one gram per cubic centimeters, if it is at 77 degrees Fahrenheit. So when we run these tests, we're going to talk about that water bath and the water temperature and, and how it, it needs to be at a certain temperature within a range of that 77 degrees. So some typical values that you should see uh, when performing both of these tests, the GMB, the compacted mix, typically your, your GMB value is going to be somewhere in the range of 2.300 to 2.500. A maximum specific gravity of that same type of material, same mixture types, somewhere between 2.400, maybe as high as 2.600. Now, that is very dependent on primarily the aggregate that's in the mix, okay? The aggregate's much more in, in uh, uh, the higher volume of the mix, the higher amount of material, and it's heavy, okay? So the heavier the aggregate type, the higher those values will be. The, the more lightweight the aggregate, the lower those values will be. So it's gonna be very uh, dependent upon the aggregate type that's in the mix. So again, those are just some relative values that you would expect to see when performing those tests. So let's look at uh, these tests a little more. So before we get to those two, we're going to talk about compacting the sample because obviously to perform a bulk gravity, we first need a compacted sample. So let's look at compacting specimens, okay? So to, to uh, uh, make these specimens, I guess is the word I'm looking for, to make these specimens or compact them, to form them, we're going to use a standard uh, ASHTO procedure, T312, Okay, and a standard uh, compaction, piece of compaction equipment, the gyratory compactor. Many people refer to it still as the super paved gyratory compactor. It was developed uh, through the super pave research and the development back in the late 90s, early 2000s. Uh, so it's been around for a number of years now. Uh, you see a picture here on the screen of a, of a typical gyratory compactor. This is actually an older model, so you may not see these very often anymore in the labs. This is one of the original uh, pine models of the gyratory compactor. But again, the super paved gyratory compactor is a standard piece of equipment. It has specific parameters that we have to make sure of uh, whenever we're going to perform the test. So depending on your piece of equipment, it's going to have certain parameters that you need to check. Ram pressure, angle of gyration, uh, height measurements. You have to uh, do a calibration to ensure that the height that's being recorded is accurate. So 
All of these things are going to need to be checked, so you need to be familiar with your piece of equipment uh, in preparation for making samples. Okay? We're going to ensure the number of gyrations that we need to use to compact the sample. Uh, so again, with the gyratory compactor, we're applying a ram pressure, we're inducing an angle of gyration, and then we're performing a certain number of gyrations on that sample. So depending on your mix type and your project, the number of gyrations should be uh, designated probably on your job mix formula where you can find that information. Also in preparation for compacting samples, uh, the gyratory molds that you're going to be using, you want to make sure that those are being preheated or they are preheated up to compaction temperature. So whatever the mixture temperature is uh, to be compacted at uh, for your particular mix, you want to make sure you preheat those molds um, uh, well in advance so that they are at that compaction temperature. Um, the mixture uh, also that you're going to be compacting, that's also going to be put into a compaction temperature oven. Uh, you're going to monitor that mix temperature to ensure that it achieves compaction temperature uh, prior to uh, mixing that or compacting that sample. Um, the entire mix that's been sampled out, typically in field condition, you've got a larger sample and you're going to need to reduce that down to individual uh, uh, gyratory size samples for individual specimens. Okay? So when that mix is workable, that big sample is workable, you're going to weigh out or you're going to split down down to individual gyratory size samples. Okay? And in this case, we'll have three individual samples that will be compacted uh, in the gyratory. All of the same mix, all being compacted at the same temperature, all being compacted to the same number of gyrations. So each one of those samples, uh, as it's quartered down and split out, you're placing each one individually into its own pan with a thermometer so you can monitor the temperature to ensure that the mix reaches that compaction temperature. Uh, so you're keeping those ovens in that compaction temperature oven to keep them at temperature until it's their turn to be compacted. So when you're ready and you've got your mix has been split out, each of the mixes is at compaction temperature and ready to be compacted. You're going to obviously first take that heated mold out of the, out of the oven, uh, get it ready. Now again, every gyratory is a little bit different, so being familiar with your piece of equipment, uh, your heated mold comes out. Most all of your gyratory molds are going to have a bottom plate, okay? So you're going to ensure that that bottom plate is in, in the bottom of the mold, obviously right side up. There's uh, some different uh, uh, equipment out there, so some mold bottoms can go in one way versus the other. So again, be familiar with your equipment. Um, you take your first mixture out that's uh, ready to go. Uh, we notice we got a shot here, a picture of uh, the mix being added in into that mold. Don't forget your uh, paper disc as well. Okay, so typically we're going to put a piece of filter paper or a paper disc below the mix as well as above the mix. This is to minimize that mixture from sticking to the to the bottom and top plate of the mold. Okay, so make sure you get that paper in there as well. But here's a shot of the mix being added into the mold. That mix is going to be added or introduced into that mold in one lift is what we call it. So we're not going to slowly trickle it in a little at a time. We're basically going to add that mixture in one lift into the mold, maybe slightly level it a little bit on top. And then obviously we'll have a top piece of filter paper uh, and possibly a top plate, again, depending on your piece of equipment. Okay, we get that uh, mold ready to go. So the next step is putting the mold into the gyratory compactor. Again, different equipment is gonna vary a little bit on how that mold is actually load, loaded into the equipment. Uh, once it's loaded and ready, uh, typically at this point, assuming you've already set your gyratory uh, to the number of gyrations uh, required for the mix, usually at this point, the only thing left to do is hit start and let the gyratory complete its number of gyrations, okay? When the gyrations are complete, our specification requirement does require that we have a certain height of compacted specimen, okay? So you notice here that our compaction uh, specimen height, the height of compacted specimen, has to be 115 plus or minus five millimeters, okay? So all this goes into how much mix we use to put in the mold. And so again, that's information that you typically can find on your job mix formula, how much material we need to make one gyratory sample to 115 plus or minus five millimeters. 
So we've got a video here that'll demonstrate compacting the sample, or at least the first step of compacting. So let's play that and I'll walk you through it. So here you can see our technician. He has the weight uh, from his job mix form that he needs to weigh out. So that is what he's doing here. He's weighing out the exact amount of material that he needs for his uh, first sample. He's loading his mold into the top of the compactor. Again, this one's different from what we saw on the picture. This one actually, the mold uh, empty, is introduced down into the chamber, lowered into it where the ram pushes up from the bottom actually. He locks it in place, again, being familiar with your piece of equipment. Now you're going to be able to see him adding his base plate. Okay, so he uses a small magnet to get that base plate in place. Notice the long sleeves, the hot gloves, we've got a hot mold. There's his filter paper that he's added to the bottom of, on top of that base plate. And again, this piece of equipment has a funnel that can help you with introducing in one lift the mix into the mold. So we added that entire sample. Top paper, he's just leveling it off slightly at the top and adding his top filter paper and then also with this piece of equipment, there is a top plate as well. So we've got a, a plate at the bottom and the top with filter paper in between. And again, with this equip, equipment, he swivels the, the head at the top in place, clamps it down, and he's ready to hit start and start his gyrations. So again, the gyratory is going to perform the number of gyrations that you uh, previously set into the machine. So again, depending on your mix type, your project is going to designate how many gyrations have to be performed. So when the gyrations are complete, uh, typically in, in most all cases, especially with quality control work, typically those specimens are going to be dense enough or stable enough that they need to be extracted immediately. Um, if they're allowed to cool in the mold, let's say overnight, you may have a problem getting them out. So the idea of getting them out as soon as possible to get them uh, free from the mold is typical. Side note, if you're doing other work, research type studies, or for whatever reason you feel like that density is very low, or the mix may, may be uh, very susceptible to, to falling apart or breaking apart, care needs to be taken and in some cases uh, samples are left in the molds for a little bit of time to allow them to cool. But in the case of what we're doing quality control work, typically you're going to be able to extract those specimens immediately. Obviously removing the filter paper from the top and bottom, uh, if you leave that then that will also can become a problem trying to remove the filter paper once the samples have cooled completely. So typically remove the paper right away place them on a, on a hard, flat surface, typically in front of a, a fan of some type to start letting those specimens cool down so that we can get them a little closer to room temperature in preparation for testing. So again, here's a, now a video just demonstrating the extruding of the sample. So back to our gyratory, you can see he's unclamping the top of the gyratory and swiveling that out of, out of the way. And again, for this particular gyratory, uh, he's going to remove his top plate uh, and with this piece of equipment the top funnel again can be used this time as he clamps it in place it's used to hold the mold down while he extrudes the sample up out of the chamber. Okay, Some other pieces of equipment have maybe a separate extractor that you take the mold out slide it into uh, to extrude the sample but for this piece of equipment it's kind of all done in that same uh, unit. He's ready to remove his top paper immediately. Typically at this point it's still warm enough he's going to have to use his gloves to handle it. He wants to take it as quick as possible over to a hard surface as you see here. Don't forget to flip it over and remove the paper from the other side. Allow it to cool back to room temperature. Okay, so once his samples have cooled to room temperature and typically rule of thumb that most people use is once you can handle those samples with no gloves, uh, they're going to still be a little warm but you can, you can handle them barehanded, uh, then they're typically ready to be uh, tested. So for the bulk specific gravity test, uh, where we're determining the relative specific gravity as compared to water of a compacted sample, that's the ASHTO T166 method A is the test method that we're going to be following. You can see the formula here that will be used, GMB equals the A divided by B minus C, and you notice there to the right, uh, 
what uh, those different uh, letters stand for. Uh, a being the dry mass of our sample, so it's the dry mass of just the sample by itself. Uh, let's jump to C. C is the mass of the sample in water. Well, that leaves B, which is a little different. If you're not familiar with this test, SSD mass of sample, and SSD actually stands for saturated surface dry. Okay, and you'll see as we uh, talk through the test and watch the video, it basically, as the, the name implies, the sample is saturated because it's been in water, uh, but yet we towel dry it to get the surface dry. So let's look at the procedure a little more and, uh, and watch the video here in just a minute. So we're going to first record that dry mass of the sample. So again, remember the sample has cooled down. We can handle it uh, with no gloves so we can get our dry mass of our sample. Now on a side note, if you were running this test on a sample from the roadway, maybe a core that was cut out of the road uh, and brought back to the lab, well that, that sample has been exposed to water through the core barrel. Okay, so some states require you to dry it back completely before you get the dry mass. Other states some, sometimes allow you to reverse the order of the weights. Maybe get your wet weights first and then come back to the dry weight. But for what we're, purposes of what we're discussing here, lab compacted samples, we get that dry mass first. And then the next step would be to take that sample and we're going to submerge it uh, in a water bath. Okay, so let's stop here a second and go back to the, the point of the water bath and the point of having the water at a certain temperature. So you notice that water bath has to be 77 plus or minus 3 degrees Fahrenheit. And centigrade, that's 25 plus or minus 1 degree centigrade. At that temperature, water has a specific gravity of one gram per cubic centimeter, okay? So if we get outside of those temperature ranges, the water density changes and it's going to affect our test. So the best case scenario is to, to control our water bath. If you're in the field in the summertime, having ice on hand to be able to cool the bath down may be uh, needed. Uh, in cooler climate, cooler time of the year, some water, people have water baths with a fish tank heater to be able to keep the water up to a certain temperature. So it can be done uh, and it must be done according to the spec. So we gotta make sure our water temperature is correct. Uh, some other things to notice on the picture here, the spec actually calls for our water bath to have an overflow. You notice the overflow pipe uh, with the bucket catching that water. This is to be able to maintain a constant uh, water depth or height of water up the, uh, up the chain there, or up the fishing line. Uh, so we're actually submerging this sample from a scale underwater, okay? So to be able to maintain that constant water height, to have the overflow, okay? The other thing to point out here, so in this stage, we're going to put the sample underwater. We're going to support it from the scale. And then we have to leave it underwater for four plus or minus one minute, okay? Now, a good, good practice is, uh, especially for the same technician, the same three samples, he's trying to be as uh, uh, repeatable as possible and cut down variables. Whatever you use for your time on your first sample, so if you use four minutes, then use four minutes for your other two samples. If you use three minutes, you determine that in three minutes it will balance out and you can get a number, then use three minutes for the other. So try to keep that consistent, but definitely make sure that you've given the sample plenty of time to stabilize and the weight on the scale has stabilized and not changing. Okay? And then you're going to record that underwater mass of the sample. Okay? And then that third value, that B value, that SSD. Okay? So what that means is you're going to be taking the sample out of the water bath so it's saturated. However, we're going to immediately, okay, we're going to blot dry with a damp towel. Okay. What this basically means is, as quickly as possible, we're going to dry it off on the surface so it still has saturated or internal moisture that's soaked into the sample, but we're drying the surface off. Okay. Now to do this, there's a specific uh, uh, method by using a damp towel, okay. and we'll see that in the video, but basically what we mean, it's a little bit of subjectiveness, but the idea is if you have a towel that's dry, it's not been exposed to any moisture, then it can tend to act like a sponge and suck water out of the sample because it's very dry. Or if you have a towel that's excessively wet, uh, then it's probably not going to do a very good job drying the surface of the sample. In fact, it may add more 
uh, moisture back to the sample. So we wanted a slightly damp towel to perform this. And then we're going to determine that weight as well. So let's look at this video as well in running the GMB procedure. So here's our technician and we see right away he's checking his water temperature to ensure he's at the right temperature. He's getting his dry weight of his sample, recording that mass. Now he's going to take his sample and submerge it in the water bath. Notice he has a, a basket that's hanging from, in this case, probably a fishing line. That's what we always use in our lab is a very small single filament uh, to, to hang, to break the surface of the water. While that sample is in the water bath for that four plus or minus one minute, he's pre-dampening his towel to have it some slight, slight moisture on it. He recorded his underwater weight and now he's taking it out and relatively quickly or immediately he starts the towel dry. Okay? The idea here is you don't want to wait and take your time. You want to immediately dry it, all the surfaces, and then get that final SSD weight. One of the biggest, again, things to remember or best practice is whatever your procedure is, repeat that each time and try to follow those same steps. Okay? So when you're towel drying, if you roll it back and forth, flip it on each side, then do that each time. So let's look again at our formula and let me give you a couple of numbers here just to be able to calculate. Okay? So the GMB again, A divided by B minus C. A, the top of our equation here again is the dry mass. So let's say our dry mass was 4790.3 grams for that, that compacted sample. B, the saturated surface dry, that final weight that he took after taking it out of the water bath was 4792.7. So right away, one thing you can notice there is it soaked up about, what, 2.4 grams of water, right? It picked up a little bit of mass from being underwater. And then C, that third weight, 2807.4 grams. So with those three weights, we plug them into our formula and we can calculate a GMB. So let's see what we get. Here's our numbers plugged in and it will give you a, a bulk specific gravity value of that compacted sample of 2.413 and this is a good opportunity or reminder from uh, time for me to remind you that with specific gravity values um, three decimal places is what we want to carry those out to so whether it's the specific gravity of, of uh, uh, compacted sample uh, or loose mix, which we'll talk about GMM later, or specific gravity of aggregate or binder, we always want to carry it to three decimal places. So 2.413 would be the bulk gravity of that compacted sample. Now, we take that value, and remember, we're going to be compacting three samples. So that was just one sample. What we ultimately are going to have are three different specific gravities of three different compacted samples. They're all the same mix, all from the same sample but three individual samples that we run the bulk specific gravity test on. So what we're going to need to do is once we have those three GMB values, we want to average all three of them to give us one average GMB value. And that's the value that we're going to use to calculate our air voids. Okay? We'll use that in a little bit later as we talk about the maximum specific gravity. But for now, let's look at calculating that average GMB. So you see our formula here, we've got the GMB from sample one, plus the GMB from sample two, plus the GMB from sample three, all of that divided by three. And that will give us the average GMB for that mixture. So here's some more numbers. Sample one, remember, we just calculated 2.413. Let's say sample two, we performed that test, we compacted a sample and ran a bulk and we got 2.412. And sample three, we compacted and ran the GMB and got a 2.409. When we plug those three numbers into our formula, and then we add those up and divide them by three, we get an average GMB for that mix of 2.411. So all three samples averaged together, 2.411 would be our bulk specific gravity for the mix. Okay? Now we're going to use that in a few minutes as well to calculate air voids but we're going to need to talk about maximum specific gravity before we get there. Okay? So again, GMM is gravity mix maximum. 
this test, the standard method that we follow is AASHTO T209. Um, and again, as we talked about before with the, in the definition, it represents 100% density or no air voids, okay, for a given uh, asphalt mixture. Okay, so those same samples that we compacted, out of that same mix, we're going to also pull some material to be able to perform the maximum specific gravity test. And then we're going to use the GMM value that we get along with that average GMB value that we just calculated to determine the relative density and the air voids of the compacted sample. So let's talk about the test a little bit. So the maximum specific gravity test, okay, so after we obtain that large sample, we're going to split out enough material to run the GMM. Now again, when you look at the AASHTO T209 method, it's going to give you a minimum size of sample for the test, depending on the nominal maximum aggregate size of your mix. So depending on your mix size is going to define how large of sample you uh, have to have to perform the uh, maximum specific gravity test. Okay? Now another thing to note, in this test method, you're taking a sample of mix, loose, okay, not compacted, but it is hot. Okay? You're going to be pouring it out onto a, onto a cookie sheet or a, a metal table surface and you're going to allow it to cool down. Well, what can tend to happen or what will happen is that mixture will want to stick together as it's cooling and create conglomerations. And by the spec, we have to ensure that we break up that mix as it's cooling and we keep it broken up so that we have no conglomerations larger than a quarter of an inch. Okay? Now, you're going to probably have some aggregate particles that are larger than a quarter of an inch, but no conglomerations of small particles stuck together. So we want to continuously work that material, roll it around, break it up as it's cooling. Okay. Also, uh, to perform this test, we're going to be weighing that mixture both in air as well as underwater, kind of like the bulk specific gravity test. So to do that, we're going to be using what we call the rice bucket. Okay. That's going to be our container that we put the sample in to weigh it, to weigh it underwater. Since we're using this bucket, we're going to have to determine the, the dry mass of that bucket. Okay, so we're going to have to, uh, ahead of time, we would typically keep our uh, sample buckets or our rice buckets calibrated so we kind of knew what was the dry mass of that sample, what was its underwater mass as well. Um, so you're going to take this sample once it's cooled down and it's down to room temperature and you can handle it without gloves and you're going to put it into the rice bucket and you're going to get a dry weight of it. Since we know the weight of the bucket, now we know the weight of the bucket in the sample, obviously we can determine the dry mass of just the sample. Here's a video just to illustrate the first steps of, of getting our uh, sample ready in the GMM test. So here's our technician has got his sample uh, for his GMM. Notice he's pouring it out onto this uh, metal countertop in front of a fan. He's going to put a light uh, draft of air on it with the fan. It's hot right now, so he's going to take some care in spreading it around and working the material to try to break up conglomerations. Early on, that's not typically a problem, but if you were to walk away and leave it, it's going to want to stick together. So he kind of stays with it. Notice he has no gloves on now and he can still work with the mix. So as it's cooling down, he's keeping it broken up. At this point, you haven't weighed the sample. So if you lose one small particle, it's not detrimental to the test. Although we want to take care not to lose any of the sample if we can avoid it. He's got his weight of his rice bucket dry. And now he's putting his sample into the bucket. And again, trying to get all of that sample off the table, so maybe a brush or some spatulas comes in handy there. And he's determining his dry mass of the sample and the rice bucket together. So once he has the dry mass of the sample in the bucket, he records that, that uh, weight. Now he goes to his water bath and he's going to take some of the water out of that water bath because remember our water bath, again, like the bulk specific gravity test, needs to be at 77 Fahrenheit. Okay, so he's going to take some of the water from the water bath and he's going to add some water to that rice bucket. So he's adding water on top of his dry sample. Okay, so that's why it's critical that we make sure we have that weight already. So he's adding water, the 77 degree water, 
taking some care as he's adding that water not to splash uh, you know, any small particles and splash them enough that they come out of the bucket. So taking care as he's, wa as he's adding water to that sample. Now, in this step of the procedure, what we're going to be doing is, remember, this test is trying to theoretically determine a zero air void state, okay? And we're going to be putting this mix underwater and getting a weight on it. However, we want to make sure that we don't have any entrapped air down inside that sample when it's underwater. So to ensure that we get all of the air out of the sample, any entrapped air, once we've submerged it underwater in the bucket, now we're going to put it on uh, a piece of equipment and actually pull a vacuum on that sample. Okay? And we notice here we've got a, the method calls for a standard vacuum pressure, 27.5 plus or minus 2.5 millimeters of mercury. So that's our required vacuum pressure. Also, while we're pulling that vacuum, okay, and we have to pull the vacuum for 15 plus or minus 2 minutes, okay, during that time we want to also agitate the sample. Either we can do it on a two-minute interval just by picking it up and shaking it by hand, or what's pretty common in most laboratories is we have uh, a piece of equipment or a device that agitates the sample at, a, at a, a slight vibration constantly throughout the 15 minutes. Okay, So you see a picture here of a uh, max gravity setup pulling the vacuum, the vacuum pump, uh, as well as the vibrator. Uh, that the sample's sitting on top of and pulling that uh, while it's pulling that vacuum pressure. So again, he's trying to evacuate any entrapped air out of the sample. Once the vacuum is complete, uh, the 15 minutes is complete, he's now going to carefully open that up uh, and he's going to take that rice bucket with the sample that's underwater and he's going to put it into a water bath suspended from a scale very similar to the bulk specific gravity test when we weighed the sample underwater. Okay, so again, as he's uh, putting the sample in the water bath, he wants to take care that as the water enter adds more water into that bucket, uh, if it's done too quickly, it can, it can flush some of the small particles out. And at this point, we've taken weight, so we don't want to lose any material. So we're going to gently add that sample or put that sample underwater. And we're going to allow it to hang from the scale completely submerged for 10 minutes, plus or minus one minute. We want to give it time to, to balance out or to level out um, and give us a steady, constant number, uh, but we leave it under there for 10 minutes, okay? Uh, so care needs to be taken when you're adding that sample into the water bath. At the end of uh, the 10 minutes, record that underwater or that submerged mass, and at that point, the test is complete, so you can take the sample out of the water bath discard that sample, and in some cases, depending on the calculation you use, determine the underwater weight of just the bucket by itself. Okay? So again, as I mentioned before, in our lab a lot of times we had the, the bucket, we would have a, uh, a dry weight and a submerged weight on that bucket, and we would routinely recheck that, say once a week, to make sure that weight's not changing. So every lab's a little different, but we need to know the dry mass and the underwater mass of the bucket. Okay? So again, if you're putting the bucket underwater, leave it under there for 10 minutes as well to stabilize to get our underwater mass. So here's a video of the rest of that procedure. So here's our dry material. We've already got the weight. So now he's introducing some of the water bath, 77 degree water. He wants to cover the mix at least one inch. So he knows he has good cover over the sample. This is the vibrating uh, apparatus. He's going to put the lid on top, which allows him to pull a vacuum pressure and hold the pressure. He's got the top clamp to hold it in place because, again, we're going to be pulling a vacuum, but we're also agitating. So we want to make sure that the, the sample is, is held firm. And behind him on the wall, you can see some of the uh, vacuum equipment, his uh, digital manometer where he can monitor the vacuum pressure. Remember, 27.5 is what he's looking for with a plus or minus 2.5. So he's well within that range, and he's going to be pulling that for that entire 15 minutes. So you can kind of see his entire setup as he's pulling the vacuum. The vibrating apparatus is doing its job. So once he's done with the 15 minutes, now he wants to gently submerge his sample in the water bath. And at this step, uh, 
uh, it, it is very helpful to take your time and go very slow so that you uh, create the smallest amount of disturbance to the water as possible. If you create a lot of waves and a lot of movement, it takes that much longer for everything to stabilize, not to mention potentially washing some of the sample out. So after he stabilized, he records that underwater mass of the sample and the bucket. So here's our formula that we want to use to calculate GMM. Okay? So let's look at what we have here, A, B, and C. If you look at what we have uh, for A, that's the mass of the oven dry sample in air. So that was the first weight we took, dry mass of the material. B is the mass of the rice bucket in water. So remember I told you depending on your lab and how you do that, you need to have a underwater weight of the rice bucket. Okay? And then C is the mass of the sample and the rice bucket in water, that final weight that he took with the sample after he vacuumed it underwater in the bucket. Okay? So with these three values, he can calculate his GMM. So let's give you some numbers here and walk you through the calculation. So if we weighed our sample in air, we have 2,098.5 grams. The rice bucket in water by itself weighs 1,464.5 grams. The sample in the rice bucket, both of those together underwater, has a submerged weight of 2,721.5 grams. Okay? So with using those three values, we plug them into our formula. Walk through that calculation, and we arrive at a GMM value of 2.494. Okay? So that's the specific gravity or the theoretical maximum specific gravity of that mix, the same mix we compacted, but now we performed it in a loose state. If we theoretically could get it to zero air voids, that would be the specific gravity of the material. So with that value and the GMB, we'll be able to calculate an air void content. And we'll talk about that in a later session.